the Air Medical Today podcast. My name is Edward Ero, and I am your host for episode 43 on April 19th, 2022. This podcast is part of the Ero Podcast Network, podcasts that inform by focusing on both the news and the people behind the news. With each episode of Air Medical Today, we explore a specific area of the air medical industry and community through the use of interviews. You can find Air Medical Today on the web at airmedtoday.com and on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, and YouTube. The audio podcast is indexed on iTunes and the video version is on YouTube. For additional information about the guest on the podcast, I also provide background data on the Air Medical Today website. If you would like to become a sponsor and or leave feedback, please write to webmaster at airmedicaltoday.com or call 612-367-6052. Today, we have a special show on the Medical Transport Leadership Institute, where we look at the past, present, and future of this great program in school. Before we get to the show, I want to go over some feedback from previous episodes and provide some general updates. Remember that Air Medical Today is also a video podcast now. As always, you can listen to the podcast and now watch it on the Air Medical Today YouTube channel. With the video podcast, you can sometimes see pictures that are referenced during the podcast. The link to the channel is on the Air Medical Today website. I apologize I have done in the past for not being able to post to Pinterest as Air Medical Today does have many followers there. Their application program interface or API limit is for only three posts a day. And as followers know, there are many more posts than that each day, especially with the continuing coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. Also on the Air Medical Today Instagram site, you can see all the posts with a URL to the news site, but the links are not clickable. This is just how Instagram works, unfortunately. If you have not listened to past podcasts, please take the time to do so. There's a wealth of information from some of the key leaders in air medical and EMS transport. Please tune in to these informative and timeless podcasts. I would also like to thank the followers of Air Medical Today on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, and YouTube. To date, Air Medical Today has 30,852 likes or followers, and it keeps increasing. Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome 10 individuals who have been involved with the Medical Transport Leadership Institute over the years. They are Bill Kegler, Don Mancuso, Denise Landis, Craig Yale, Connie Easley, Ed Morasco, Tom Allenstein, Jared Sherman, Tom Liebman, and Cameron Curtis. Each of them will introduce themselves, including their current position, the position they were in when involved with MTLI, and where they are from. I will also participate since I was part of MTLI from the very beginning. We are doing this show as part of the 25th anniversary of the genesis of MTLI and the week before we begin classes, which will produce the 24th graduating class of certified medical transport executives. I encourage you to watch the video version of the podcast as you get to not only hear, but see some of the individuals that built this school and who carry on the tradition today. Well, this is this is fantastic. Thank you all for for being here. I know it's way, way too early for some of you, like four o'clock in the morning. Uh, but this is the only time that we could get everybody uh, together uh, to talk about MTLI. So um, we're going to move this along and we'll have some time at the end to, to reflect on what everybody has uh, said. So first off will be uh, Bill Kegler. And so Bill, take it away. Good morning, MTLI. Um, my name is Bill Kegler. I uh, am the retire <clears throat> retired assistant director of the Ogilvy Park Ogilvy Resort and Ogilvy Foundation. And uh, I'm happy to be here today uh, to talk about MTLI, the origins, and, and how it has uh, progressed over the years. What, I've, what I was thinking about when I was going to speak was that 
probably students and, and you sitting there are wondering why in the world am I going to Wheeling, West Virginia and not going to Las Vegas and not going to uh, Dallas and New York City and, and going to different locations around the year. And I need to tell you a little bit about the history of the National Training Center at Ogilvy. Uh, Ogilvy uh, is the only self-sustaining park system in the United States, where if you look in your, your community, you'll find most parks have tax bases and they are supported by taxes. Ogilvy never was and had to become a self-sustaining park system uh, from the beginning. And the way that it is basically self-sustaining with over a $25 million budget is the quote unquote cash cow, which is the hotel and the cottages and the golf courses and so forth. And it's been very successful and we're well known in the parks and recreation business. Having said that, the National Recreation Park Associations <clears throat> started a school back in the late 1960s called the Revenue Sources Management School. Interestingly, it is well over 50 years old. They're having their anniversary. They have never left Little Wheeling, West Virginia uh, on the Ohio River. They have stayed, and that's because we have created a model for associations that we actually have a staff that does registration, that assists with the school, that, that uh, does a lot of the work. That there's an ulterior motive to Ogilvy in that it is, uh, as my boss said, when I became the lodge manager back in the late uh, 1970s, early 80s, he said, we've got to do something to, can, to get occupancy up. And he said, the best thing we have are the two or three schools that we have in 1980 that uh, fill the hotel every year. Conferences and conventions don't go back to hotels every year. You might get a three-year contract or a five-year contract, but nobody has a 50-year contract. The maintenance management school at Ogilvy with the National Recreation Park Association is having their 50th anniversary in August of 2022. And someday I hope MTLI has their 50th anniversary. And I'm not sure that I want to be here for it, as I, as I can continue growing older, it, it's fun and I love my grandkids. And I told Ed earlier this morning, he said, well, tell us what you do now. And my nickname is Pop Uber. And what I do is, is take grandkids to golf courses and to plays and to musicals and so forth. So it, it's great. But the key to Ogilvy and the, the reason MTLI started was that in the early 80s, with my director saying, fill the hotel, we actively started looking for other associations that would have management schools. And we were able to, to present what we could offer, which was registrations and assistance. And, and most associations in the early uh, 80s and 90s had very small staffs. Some of the associations we worked with were an association director and maybe a part-time uh, uh, assistant who was answering the phone. So it would have been very difficult for them to take in the registrations for schools of 200 and 250 people. So the Ogilvy staff with, with the contracts and negotiations we had with the different associations took over the management of the schools, the management of registration, uh, getting in the rooms, feeding the uh, students and so forth. So that gives you sort of an idea why the schools are at Ogilvy and why you're coming to Wheeling, West Virginia, and why it has continued throughout the years. In the mid-1980s, we went from two schools, and I think our peak was, was maybe towards the end of the 90s when MTLI came on board, we were actively running 17 national schools at one time. Many of those schools uh, came to, uh, finished up and, and, and basically went through their membership and, and couldn't support the schools any longer, so they disappeared. A couple of schools got so big that, that Ogilvy couldn't support them, so they took the model and moved to a larger conference convention center somewhere else. But I just checked, and there are still eight national schools at Ogilvy, and most of them have uh, long-term uh, status such as MTLI, which I believe is, is right near 25 years if it's, if it's not there yet. So that's why we're at Ogilvy. Uh, I was very happy 
to get started with, with the MTLI group back in the 90s. Uh, Don uh, came to the, or gave me a call and said that I think, if I'm recalling correctly, she, she was associated with, with the campground school and, and said, we'd like to come chat with you and see if there's something we can do. She can, she can elaborate on that when it's, when it's um, her turn to speak. I'm not going to go into to, to anything else other than I wanted people to know why you're at Wheeling, West Virginia. We love Wheeling, West Virginia. I grew up here, uh, and and we think that we provide a very uh, uh, nice location and the beautiful foothills of the Alleghenies. Please come back to MTLI, and Ed, I'm going to I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Bill. Our next speaker then is uh, Don Mancuso. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dawn Mancuso. I am the former um, executive vice president and CEO of um, the Association of Air Medical Services. And I'm currently the executive vice president and CEO of the Association of Schools and Colleges of Optometry. As um, I, I'm, call, I'm here from Bethesda, Maryland, uh, just outside of Washington, DC. Um, as Bill mentioned, um, uh, before I worked for Ames, I worked for the National Association of RV Parks and Campgrounds. So that organization, and I'm sorry if you hear noise in the background, but I have a very vocal senior cat who I have very little control over. Um, the, uh, the National Association of RV Parks and Campgrounds um, did operate a leadership institute. And um, as the... Um, uh, deputy CEO there was very familiar with the program and knew Bill and knew what um, Ogle Bay's capabilities were. In um, the fall of 1996, I, became, I changed jobs and took over the CEO position at Ames, and we started a strategic planning process. At the time, uh, Connie Easley was president, Denise Landis was our uh, president-elect, and we started talking about what we, our vision for Ames in the future. And out of those discussions came um, the vision for a role that Ames could play in building the leadership pipeline for medical transportation services. Um, we were beginning to see turnover, um, increasing turnover in the program director level positions. We saw uh, an increasing number of bases opening up requiring um, local level leadership. Um, and we just saw a need for um, training for folks who want to move up from uh, clinical operational roles into leadership roles. So um, we started talking about how we might do something like this. And the light bulb went off in my head and said, you know, we've done this before in another organization. Let me talk to Bill and see if there's an opportunity here. And, and he was very excited about it. Olga Bay was very welcoming. Um, but frankly, I had to um, do a little um, uh, uh, sales <laughs> to get folks to consider going to Wheeling, West Virginia. So um and, and frankly, this was a large undertaking for our small organization and the thought of uh, how we would do this and you know, how would we do something that was comprehensive and viewed as um, a real tool for the, for the entire community um, seemed a little daunting. So um, I, Denise and I took a little trip and we visited Wheeling, West Virginia and, and Bill took us on a tour and explained to us how the schools work with other um, professions. And I think the light bulb then went off in Denise's head and I'll, I'll let her talk about that, but we could see the potential. So um, I think that was June of 97 that we took that visit. And the next month we uh, presented a proposal to the board of directors about doing what we at that time called the AIM School for Medical Transport Excellence. Um, and I, we had identified some potential topic areas and a game plan for putting um, such an institute in place. So we then went to work and we, the board approved it. And um, in August, the very next month, we pulled together a list of five or six people. I found the list. Um, so it was Denise and I, 
Um, Ed Eero is one of them at the time. I think he worked for uh, Air Care in Kalamazoo. Um, the uh, Bob Friedis from Life Live at UMass. Connie was there and Craig was there. I think was at Rocky Mountain Helicopters and Lori Dickinson from Mercy Air Life in, in Des Moines. And um, so that was six of us in a room with, with Bill and tried to put our arms around putting together such an institute. Um, and we, at that time, we were just did a brain dump. We took a look at all the different topics that could be covered in such a leadership institute. We did some um, uh, coalescing around what the, the main topics should be. And we got a lot of guidance from Bill about how there are many topics that um, all leaders across all professions have to, to know something about. Um, and so we took that advice and built a, a curriculum. We also identified some, some leaders in the profession who would be good instructors or regents for the, for the um, institute. Um, and you know, among that group um, were the, the six that were part of the pl initial planning group, but quickly came up with some other names, including Ed Morasco, who I think was at Stat Medevac at the time, and Cy Woodrum from Arch Air Medical Services and, and a few others, and um, um, built the curriculum, built the, the first year's um, training programs and all the materials, came up with a class schedule, um, came up with policies um, from related to everything from how the classes would work and whether or not you take attendance and what an exam looks like and um, is this going to eventually lead to a certification to, um, you know, how do we um, sustain this program and develop um, criteria for new regions and bring them on board and, and what rotation schedules might look like. So, um, you know, it was, it was largely a, 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 a huge undertaking for a whole bunch of volunteers who built something that I'm very happy to see is, is long lived and, and, and continues to, to serve the community. Um, first class was held in the spring of 1998 and the rest is history. Um, so, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and share that, you know, early history of the, of the Institute. It's um, certainly something I, I treasure as a great memory and, and as I said, so glad to see it continuing. Thank you, Dawn. Um, next uh, is uh, Denise Landis. Uh, thank you, Edward, for having uh, me join the group this morning. Uh, the good thing about my spot is that I, I follow Bill and Don, who are excellent historians, and gave um, a lot of the background that I was going to talk about. So you can tell what a great team it was right off the beginning. Um, so I would like to pick up where Don left. I remember that visit Connie had asked me to go with Don. Um, she tasked me as that would be my job as president elect to go visit Ogle Bay. And, uh, the nice part about this is I, I got dressed up in a suit and, you know, wanted to play the part. And when we got there, I remember Bill looking at me and asking um, if I had a pair of blue jeans with me. And I said, well, yes, I did. So I went and changed my clothes and got very comfortable as uh, we took a tour of Ogle Bay. The, um, the item that struck me was the, the beauty of Ogle Bay and the lodge and the learning environment, and you could certainly see the attraction of going back there to learn. Uh, the beauty is what would distract you, not uh, motel rooms and all the other kinds of things you usually get with a conference. Um, the other striking thing, as Dawn talked, is uh, when we started talking about a curriculum and what we thought that students might need, um, we chat a little bit more and that's when Bill said, well, you have to come up with a group of people. Who do you, who do you call when you want some information uh, to talk about your program? So that's how we came up with the original group. And then we added some names and that's when Bill surprised us all. Well, we weren't just a think tank. We were also going to be the instructors and that we all kind of sat back and said, oh my gosh. Um, because we were all working full time and we all had families uh, and uh, we just had to 
suck it up and go for it. And we all did that. At the time, um, I was the clinical director uh, for the University of Michigan Survival Flight and SWAT program. And currently I am living the dream. Uh, I am retired and it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and I, I do keep involved um, with the air medical industry, but from afar. Uh, so uh, life is very enjoyable once you retire. So getting back to the curriculum, the interesting thing is, and I remember Bill saying this, you have to treat everybody that's coming to the school as a novice. Um, even though we've been in the business, those of us that were sitting around the table, we were like, oh my God, how can we talk about hiring practices, you know, orientation or marketing? Everybody knows that. But Bill would take us back to the premise. No, you have to assume everybody's a novice. And at the time when the school started, honestly, most flight nurses were the ones that got promoted into the um, clinical director or whatever, or manager of their flight programs. And at that time we were focused on air because that's what it was and actually focused in terms of helicopters. Um, while some people had airplanes, it, it was the helicopter piece that drew our attention. So as we got a group of people to agree with this and we developed the Regent model um, and we became Regents by being there. And it was very much of an honor to do so. Um, so when we dug deeper and developed the actual um, objectives for each, each course we had, we had to, uh, which, was, which was the most fun thing, is encourage pilots, mechanics, nurses, paramedics, and anybody else that might be associated within the flight program that would be a part of it. And that was, and that's where Bill kept directing us about the challenge of what we were developing with the school. And, and it worked. And so no matter how simple you thought you might be speaking to a group of students, you were always back to the basics. And after we had a successful first year, that is when we started thinking about second year and then the certification process with the hopes that CMTE would be built into job descriptions in the future um, so that people had a good foundation as they would move forward and take future roles in their programs. So it, as you know, the program is very successful. I was very proud that Connie had asked me to partake in this leadership with this program while she was busy with so many other things. Um, and the great leadership we had with, with Dawn and Bill and one of the feedbacks that was so important every year, and we did surveys and, and originally with the, with the uh, regents, you know, who would get the best scores, who would get the most positive comments. So the other thing about the regents as we started the school uh, was we left all of our hats at the door. Uh, we, we, we were there for one general purpose and it was education and the camaraderie uh, I think it, it came through to the students and while we were, quote, the instructors, we were a part of them and we understood what they struggled with and, and what they needed to learn. And uh, the environment for learning at Ogle Bay is, I'm sure, is still as wonderful as it was when we were there. And um, I was just also thankful to be a part of it um, during my career. And again, I thank you very much for this opportunity, Edward, to speak about it. Thanks so much, Denise. <clears throat> I know you were up uh, way too early today, so <laughs> okay. I really, really appreciate it. So we'll now turning over to uh, Craig Yale. Thank you, Edward. Or I was on mute there. Um, my name is Craig Yale, and uh, currently I have a consulting practice, the Yale Group. I'm president of, and uh, at the time it was I was working for Rocky Mountain Helicopters. Had recently come over there from having been um, involved with Penrose St. Francis Healthcare System in Colorado Springs, where I helped start the Flight for Life program there back in 1983. And I was approached by uh, Denise and Connie. Uh, as mentioned with this early group to go ahead and talk about um, possibility of having some type of leadership training. One of the things that we had recognized at the time 
was that there were an awful lot of people that were being promoted into senior management positions that uh, had previously been in clinical roles or had been pilots or whatever else. But most common thing was, was they didn't have any type of formal business training. And we realized that a lot of these people were struggling. You know, they'd, they'd never seen a set of financials before. They'd never had p &L responsibility in an organization. And the other thing that was changing was, was that the flight programs themselves were becoming more sophisticated, larger, more equipment, et cetera. And so instead of being a, a, you know, a, a manager or a director in a department within a hospital, you actually really were becoming the chief executive for a business and a business in many times that ran several million dollars a year through its budget. And so we felt like we needed to provide an education for those people. Um, I remember the, you know, the book that had come out at the time that was a um, so many minute manager type of a thing in order to be able to get somebody into those type of roles. And the idea was we could go ahead and help them with a two weeks worth of education, be able to understand at least what others were talking about and give them some hunger to be able to go ahead and, and go further in their own educations. We knew we couldn't you know, provide them a master's degree in two weeks, but we did realize the opportunity was there to be able to entice them into being able to forward their educations and be able to go further. I remember one student telling me after their first year that they had come with a certain degree of trepidation because they couldn't figure out why they would consider themselves qualified to be able to be at a national school for a leadership type of training. And they realized at the end of the school that they put on their pants one leg at a time, just like everybody else. And that person went on to become a vice president, of one of the major companies that was out there. So again, I think we've, we've challenged people and it's been able to get there. I was asked to talk about um, those early classes and what features are still constant throughout it. And I think one of the things that I find a great deal of pride in is that it's still very student-centric, that, that we let the students drive the agenda. Um, as Denise said, we, we put together the original set of objectives based on our own uh, communal thoughts that we had, Bill's advice and, and et cetera but we immediately started to play off of the evaluations we got that first year in order to be able to figure out where we'd hit the mark and where we needed to move forward. But one of the things that we knew from starting into it was that we really wanted to run a school, not a conference, that there were plenty of conferences out there for everybody to go to. But the advantage of the school was of course that it was really an education type of a process and that we expected people to engage as though they were at a school also. And another one of the key focuses was to remember that it was a leadership school. There was a leadership institute. A lot of times when you looked at the surveys, there were comments about why isn't there more clinical in it? Why isn't there more specific to air medical type of things? Why don't we have, you know, whatever this particular hot topic was? And where the cracker barrels, for those that have gone, are the type of thing we can do in the evening where we can be on those type of subjects. We wanted the school to remain true to the idea of being in leadership institute and teaching leadership subject matter. So we've, we've always kept that piece that's there also. Another key element that's there has been the, the commitment of the instructors. The instructors or regents um, have always been just an amazing group of people. I, I um, have just been amazingly humbled to be part of the group of people that have shown up year after year to be able to make this happen. And they commit not only the, the week that they're there, but quite a bit of time throughout the rest of the year being able to um, adjust, prepare, be able to work on their subject matter and promote the school. So there's a lot to being a regent or an instructor also that's there. And again, it's, I, I count them as some of my best friends I've ever had in life are the, the various regents and instructors that I've had a chance to be able to participate with. And then there's the students and the students are truly amazing also. Um, as Connie, or, or rather Denise said, one of the things that was a premise early on was that we would leave our, our logo wear at the door or leave our caps at the door. And the same thing is true of the students. What's amazing to me is to watch the students very shortly after they get there, realize that they're part of the school and they're part of a community, um, but, but they quickly forget any type of competitive type of a thing. I, I remember an incident one time with a, a student who asked me, he said, so I've got this situation with a competitor and I'd like to know how it is that you would deal with it. How would you compete against this situation? 
And I went ahead and told him and he then looked at me, he said, you know, now I'm feeling a little guilty about the thing. I probably should have come clean at the beginning. The competitor is you. And I said, yeah, I knew that. And he said, so why did you give me such an honest answer? And I said, because it's Opal Bay, it's the school, it's MTLI, you know, I mean, you asked me a legitimate question, I gave you an answer. Um, that guy went on to work for me afterwards. I mean, I really enjoyed the opportunity, but I mean, the fact is, is that you'll see people that are competitors every day that then will turn around through the CMT listserv and ask each other questions and get support from it. So again, I think the students are just an amazing part and they're part of what makes the community of of transport medicine, what it is. And I think that's really been a big piece of it. Other things that are consistent is the is the structure. The, the year one being fully didactic as you go through the, the program and the test that's afterwards. And year two being didactic in the morning and a project. Now, the project has really matured over the years. When we first started in year two, the, um, the projects were, um, in many cases, not terribly different than the subject we're using today, but they were consistent with what was real at the time in the industry. And the students had to, in many ways, sort of make up all the parts that they had to fill in the blanks on in order to be able to make the, the projects work. And uh, they sometimes got very creative in being able to fill those roles. But uh, the capstone now has gotten to a level of maturity that is something that I'm just terribly proud of. And that is the entire environment has been put together the, the different members or the different projects have a certain degree of interlacing with each other. Um, and the, the demands, if you will, or the deliverables now have matured a great deal also. And so they're, they're more sophisticated. And I think it's just added to the quality. Another thing that's consistent is, is Ogle Bay itself. The school being able to be there in Wheeling, West Virginia, and specifically at Ogle Bay is a, major piece of what's made it successful. It's, again, not a Las Vegas or an Orlando or whatever else where there's all sorts of distractions. It's the ability to come there and you're going to be there. You're going to be at the school. The facility is where you can interact with each other. And the students, I think, get a great deal of value from being able to interact with each other. In fact, um, arguably, that's at least 50% of the value of the school is the interaction that you have with other students. And so I think that that both the location and just the, the nature of this of Ogle Bay and the uh, classroom spaces and the, the way that the lodge is set up. And, you know, for those who have gone, the amount of time you can spend studying in the library, et cetera, are all important pieces of uh, what makes Ogle Bay work. So, uh, Ed, thank you very much for the chance to be able to be here. I, you know, one of the things I will always be proud of was the opportunity to be able to be part of this and to, uh, work with that original group to be able to put the school together. Thanks so much, Craig. Okay, we're gonna move along. Uh, Connie Easley. Good. Um, you've heard about the vision of MTLI from both Denise and Don in the 1990s and how uh, MTLI was started with the guidance from Bill. Um, his knowledge of the other campground schools and the other schools was instrumental in how we set the program up. Um, Craig talked about the consistency with the program and MTLI. And I'm going to talk just for a little bit about the first editions and changes for MTLI. At the time of MTLI started, I was at Loyola Lifestar and then had moved to Fitch and Associates, um, where I worked for 10 years consulting with uh, Chris Zoller. Now, currently I'm semi-retired. I'm still doing some consulting, um, but uh, getting a chance to see the grandkids and uh, uh, take care of some health issues has been a good, good year for me. Um, so once you graduate, as, as Craig talked about, you become a, a CMTE, a Certified Medical Transport Executive. And to be maintain your CMTE, you have to have 30 MEUs per, per three years. So an MEU, we call it a medical education unit, similar to what we all know as CEUs. Now, you can obtain those MEUs from hospital classes that you take in management or leadership or seminars that you go to or um, getting your master's degree in some type of a topic. Um, but we heard from, again, the evaluation of the students 
was the second year students had nothing to do after they graduated. And they really wanted to come back to MTLI. So the, hence the grad school was uh, born. And um, it started out probably with about 30 students, I would imagine. And this year we'll have over 65. Um, so it continues to grow. The uh, uh, MEUs that you can obtain from uh, grad school almost complete your three-year requirement for your CMTE. And we heard from the graduates that they wanted more current events, more you know, activities and, and lectures that were could affect their daily work life. So the themes were very similar from what we had in our first year and second year, but we wanted to put current events so that the medical transport members dealing with those daily lives had, had recent information. The topics and themes stayed the same, might be strategic or operational, financial, safety, human resources, but we dove down for each of the lectures as we went. So for example, in a safety lecture at grad school could be something, what's, what's past just culture? What's the next step is one of our lectures we have this year. Um, for HR topics, we actually have looked at employee engagement and a deeper dive into how to assist programs deal with HR issues. Um, and one of the key things for grad school is that we try and give them a toolbox. We try and give them um, topics and tools that they can take home and use um, back at their program. Some of the other educational topics have included in the last year, recent events. Last year, we had a COVID panel um, where we had three uh, uh, experts, subject matter experts, come and talk about the challenges and the lessons learned dealing with COVID. Um, one was a large air and ground company executive. One was a mostly ground, smaller air and then a smaller program with both air and ground. And they actually went through a very good um, overview of how to deal, how they dealt with COVID and perhaps opportunities for the future. Um, this year, we have both a No Surprises Act um, four hour uh, lecture, where we'll talk about the recent billing issues. Um, we're also going to do um, uh, kind of a one-off and we're going to talk about mobile, mobile integrated health care for a full day and how that's going to affect transport and our hospitals that we work with. Um, so we really try and, and look at topics that are a deeper dive in the same theme as, as uh, leadership and management. One other change that we made was we created a pathway to re-entry for the CMTEs. So if you're a CMTE and you did not renew your CMTE uh, with your MEUs during that three-year period, we now have a pathway. Um, I don't know, Tom, we've probably gotten 10 or 12 people now through the pathway. Um, this year we have seven, I think. And so if you have not renewed your CMTE, you can uh, sign up for grad school. And during grad school, then you have to take a pretest, just like our first year test, um, on the topics and the material from year one and year two. And then you become part of your own grad school capstone simulation group that Craig touched on. And they will be given a scenario just like the rest of the second year students. And uh, during their off time then from lectures, they uh, enjoy the opportunity, which they'll all talk about, um, to get together <laughs> and write a whole capstone simulation and, and um, uh, determine the answer for that, that scenario. <clears throat> they much sure would, I'm sure they would much rather be in the library with uh, some of those first year students, but uh, this is a good way for them to rejoin the CMT group and uh, uh, come back. I think Craig and, and Denise both talked about the Ogle Bay experience. For me, it was the isolationism. I mean, you're really up there and you're really, you know, there with your friends and new colleagues and you don't really mingle like a conference. Um, so it's a, it's a excellent opportunity for the school to go through. Um, I think that's pretty good overview of, of grad school, Ed. I'll turn it back over to you. 
Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Connie. We're going <laughs> to, we were going to take a break, but we're moving along much faster than I thought. So we're, uh, keep moving here. Uh, next up is uh, Ed Marasco. Hey, Edward. Thanks. And uh, it's delighted, delighted to be here with this gang as always. Um, so I currently serve as the Vice President of Business Development at Quickman Claims. But at the time, until I was founded, I was serving as the Vice President of Emergency Services at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and um, on the Board of Directors of the Stat Medivac Program. And I had the privilege of serving uh, as a member of the Council of Regents at the time the school was founded and um, presiding over some of the most uh, tumultuous times in MTLI's history as the chair. And as folks have already mentioned to you, um, you know, the birth of this thing called MTLI was something that was born out of need in the industry. And, and uh, we were blessed to have leaders um, in the association and at Ogilvy that, that recognized that void as a part of the strategic planning process that, that I think Don and Denise both talked about um, and found a way forward uh, to put the program together. And um, that vision um, of, of the board at the time and the leaders uh, really set us on a path that, you know, here we are almost 25 years later, um, you know, of great success. Um, for, for me, as I looked at, as I look back, reflected back on the time that we've, we've sort of had together, um, it's like, it was like raising a family uh, for us. And, and, so the, the leadership of Ames, the Ames board and the leadership at Ogilvy sort of were like the parents of this thing called MTLI. And, and uh, as you might imagine, in that sort of situation, you have all those normal family dynamics. And the old adage about raising kids is, uh, you know, it takes a village. You know, for children, it's, you know, it's immediate family, it's extended family, it's close friends. And then later on in life, it expands to teachers, coaches, um, you know, role models in the community, that sort of thing. So that concept of a village really applies ever so keenly to MTLI. And I think over the course of time, um, you know, Ames and Ogilvy, the, the leadership of the associations kind of delegated that responsibility for raising this child to the Council of Regents. And, um, you know, much like, much like your teachers and, and early role models in your development, um, and, and it, was, it was a great time to be a part of it. And as in real life families, there's, there's always a myriad of emotions at play. We, we suffered through, um, you know, births and, and deaths together. Um, there was all that um, concern about the future of the school and trepidation. We enjoyed uh, great joy and great success. Uh, we also enjoyed the challenges together, um, trying to carry the school forward during difficult times. I mean, I can recall... Um, and I think it was Denise that talked about this, you know, sort of the enthusiasm for getting folks together. But I can recall a time when we, we looked at each other and said, you know, is this thing going to be done in a year or two? Because we've run through everybody who's sort of a leader in the industry and all the aspiring leaders. You know, little did we know at the time that, you know, and I can't remember the exact numbers of base sites or sizes of organizations, but but I don't think we really appreciated where the industry was headed when we, you know, we're, we're in those first few years. And with the expo explosion in the industry, you know, of course, here we are, um, you know, almost, what, 23 years later, and the numbers are still staggering to me as, as we, you know, head into going to Wheeling again here in a week or so. Um, you know, in the case of the council um, and how it operated, um, you know, Denise served as our, as our school principal, um, and I'm sure for her, very much it was like that. It was like herding cats, and there were quite a few times when, um, I'm sure she wished she had a giant sized paddle with holes drilled in it, like a, you know, like a wiffle ball uh, to keep us in line. But um, she did that and she cultivated the passion of the council and the instructors. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, I think the council sort of was always the constant and that focus on the mission. And, and part of that was, you know, the passion, as Craig mentioned, for, for educating and the fact that we needed it in the industry. But a great deal of that was personal commitment to Denise and, and for those of us who've known her for all these years, not wanting to let her down and let the school down. So I think, you know, that sort of focus on our mission and, and Denise keeping us rolling forward is something that gave us stability and a strong foundation uh, as we move forward. But like anything, um, like any organization uh, or family, you know, change is, change is something that's, that's pretty much a given. You know, as as MTLI grew older and more mature, I think 
you, you know, we had to find a way forward. So, um, you know, we went through the normal sort of growing pains in life. Uh, you know, one of the challenges we faced was, um, you know, parental changes, you know, leadership at Ames changed, leadership at Ogilvy changed. And we went through uh, a difficult time um, when leadership at MTLI changed. And I think um, one of the challenges uh, was trying to carry forward the foundations that we had, but also it did give us an opportunity to sort of relook back at what we were doing, almost a second strategic planning exercise uh, to say, hey, what's the school doing now? What do we need to do in the future? The industry is changing uh, the types of people that are becoming leaders, the number of leaders, what they need to know and understand. And so I think it was, it was an opportune time for us as a group with all that tumultuous sort of evolution around us to say, um, you know, how can we make the school better? And so we did some things, you know, we, we brought in fresh, fresh ideas, new people, new instructors. We found a path forward to create the next sort of the stepping stone to become the next council of regents, because uh, as some folks on this call have already pointed out, we're, we're not getting any younger. And even, you know, five or six years ago, we, we certainly weren't, you know, this group was starting to age and move on to other things and those sorts of things. So we found a way to make the council of regents sustaining. And I think, you know, as you look at the talent that's on that group today, uh, you know, we found a, a way forward to create new ideas and we had to move the school forward. There were there were changes, as I mentioned, in the industry, but also the other thing was to make it sustainable. And so I think um, um, I'm proud of the fact that we moved through those that time period and really applied some of those same concepts that we teach at MTLI to the folks who were there to our own situation uh, to, to really create, uh, you know, uh, a new, a new uh, sort of normal for, for uh, MTLI and our, whether it's our relationship with o Ames or Ogilvy and, and how, we, uh, how we interact. Uh, we made changes, as others have mentioned, in the curriculum based on feedback from the students. So through all that change and, and uh, all the sort of improvements that have been made, uh, for me at least, the one thing I look at has been the consistency um, of the role of the Council of Regents and the instructors, and always staying focused on the mission of the, of the school itself. So uh, as we approach now, as Bill pointed out earlier, the 25th anniversary of MTLI, I'm hopeful that, that this one constant uh, remains at the forefront uh, of MTLI for is that we have to focus on what the needs of the students are and the needs of the industry are. And, and hopefully we've put the right structures in place um, to be able to sustain it for another 25 years. And I'm with Bill. I don't, I'm not sure I want to be around that long. I probably won't be able to walk in those days. So um, Edward, thanks again. And uh, I'll send it back to you. Great. Thank you, Ed. Uh, next is uh, Tom Allenstein. Thanks, Edward. Um, and it, what an honor it's, it is to be here with all of these great people, uh, mentors of mine, people that I have idolized and looked up to for so many years. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Tom Allenstein, uh, currently the president and CEO at MedFlight of Ohio. I was not like the uh, others that have spoken already. I was not an original uh, region. I was on the board of Ames uh, when the school first started. And uh, I was in one of the early classes, and I remember sitting in those classes and just being in awe of these instructors, regents that were out there, and, and really learning from them and, and the school, and uh, so wanted to be a part of it. And when uh, Denise asked if I wanted to become a regent, man, was I honored and, and just wanted to jump at the opportunity. Uh, behind me in my picture, you'll see beautiful Wilson Lodge. I mean, this is the setting that we're in, uh, very rustic. And in the early days, it was so fun because you had no connectivity to the outside world. You had to drive up the hill to get a cell phone uh, reception. And that was the way that you could, you know, communicate to the outside world. So you were forced to network with the people that were there. And it was so fun to just network and, and really be in that learning environment. Through the years, you know, we've adapted. As I said, you know, we didn't have connectivity at first. And I remember Edward bringing in a router for the first time, just so that we could have some Wi-Fi connection at Wilson Lodge. And, uh, and, and Edward, you know, uh, love you, but you were always, you know, 
pushing that, you know, how do we, how do we communicate if we don't have Wi-Fi and, and everything else? So, you know, we had to get innovative. We had to change up things. And, and really, as we've gone through, you know, we've been constantly adapting. I think uh, Ed Marasco talked about, uh, or Craig talked about, you know, the students and the evaluations and what that really does is it gives us that framework for what do we need to change. We have constantly been adapting the curriculum to what the current needs are. I mean, we've seen changes throughout the years. Uh, Some of the, the classes have stayed consistent. You know, we always need basic finance. We need basic culture. We need some of those safety concepts and all of that. But then, you know, as we've gone, how we market our, our services has changed um, as we look at uh, how we are going to hire and onboard people have changed. Um, as, as we look at today, provider wellness is one of our new classes that we're, we're providing now because all of this has adapted throughout the years. Uh, some of the other uh, people have spoken about sustainability. And, and I do remember those early years talking, well, we've dried up all the new leaders. Now what are we going to do? And, and how are we going to continue to move that forward? And we continue to see new leaders coming in. I mean, I sit up in front of this class and I'm looking out at the audience and I'm seeing people who are much smarter than I, much more experienced than I, in the audience, and I'm supposed to be teaching them. And and we've adapted to find, you know, we're learning as much from the students as the students learn from us. And and we become interactive in how we do things uh, with the students. And, And it's such an exciting time every year for me to go, because as I said, I learn more than sometimes I impart upon others. But the curriculum continues to adapt as we look at uh, what the future is. Um, we have added more ground only types of services. AOS, BOS ambulances are now sending their leaders because this is a basic leadership school. And as Denise and others mentioned, you know, Bill imparted upon us, this is the group that you need to teach. doesn't matter if they're a CEO of, uh, you know, a multi-million dollar company or they're a front, you know, line provider. They all need to know the basics of leadership. And that's what we try to stay true to with our curriculum. And that's what we truly uh, aim to provide to the students out there is uh, what are the basics of leadership? And then how do we share that back and forth? And so there's a lot of interactivity in uh, in the classes that we do now. Um, You've seen a lot of changes in the curriculum as far as how do we impart uh, upon the classes, that interactivity. Um, Tom Liebman and I teach a class that we use a Jeopardy game now in which, you know, we're throwing out the, the answers uh, or the questions and, and they have to provide, you know, the feedback as to how do you solve this problem? And that's what makes it a lot of fun is that interactivity. We talk about going to the library and it's that social hour after class that I think we learn the most from. And how do you write that into a curriculum? How do you truly take those pieces that are so important, which is that social time, the connectivity and all of that, and write it into a curriculum? We've done that. We've done that at Ogle Bay and, and it's been such a great success. Um, We constantly are adapting, and you'll hear some more people talk about the capstone project. When I went through, um, yeah, we had a a simple capstone project. We had five uh, other people that were involved in this. I've never met them before in my life, right? Those five people became some of my best friends in the world because we're forced to work together for, you know, four or five days and come up with a near impossible task. And we had to sit and try and figure out how to solve that problem um, without having connectivity, mind you. I had to carry, you know, uh, a binder that was, you know, six inches thick with all my monographs and, uh, and and really try and figure that out. Now, 
you know, we've got everything on a learning management system. So at the click of a button, I can connect up, I can get everything that I need at my fingertips. I can dial a friend easily. Back then we couldn't, could we? You know, it was not uh, as simple back then as it is today. So you have seen the school evolve, but some of the stuff that has never changed is what, like I said, behind me, the rusticness of Ogle Bay, the seclusion, the ability to just be with colleagues. And I am so blessed to have been part of this program. And I am so blessed and thankful for the opportunity to be a part of this program as it has truly changed my life. Um, and the people that, you know, are talking uh, are some of my best friends that I've ever had in, in, in the world. And, and this has been the secret. And this is the magic of what MTLI truly is. Thanks, Edward, for the opportunity to share. And I look forward to hearing what the rest have to say. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tom. Next is uh, Jared Sherman. Yeah, thanks, Edward. Uh, Jared Sherman, Vice President of Operations um, in the Northwest for Global Medical Response. And as I was thinking about my initial experiences at, at MTLI, I, I really, I'm a, I would call myself a non-traditional student when it, when it came to MTLI. Um, and, and I really think back and I owe every success I've had in this industry to the relationships that I built at MTLI. And I think why, and my, my question goes back to um, probably my greatest skill in life is to be a master question asker. And, and what that means for me is I have to surround myself with experts. So when I got into the industry, I was thrown into the deep end as a director of HR and compliance, having never even been in an ambulance or seen an aircraft. Um, and, you know, I had a group there of 50 or 60 clinicians and pilots, but that, that, that group of SMEs could only provide so much education to me. Um, and so when I came to, to MTI over 10 years ago, it opened up an entire new group of folks. Um, and, and every year since, I get to surround myself with 200 plus SMEs, um, subject matter experts in the industry, and I get to pick their brain. And I get to understand what, what, what works, what doesn't work. And then I get to, to, to learn from them about how to be a better leader. And then also what I don't have in the industry is the, the on the ground knowledge. And so I can truly ask them and gain that so that I can understand that when that when the aircraft door closes or when the ambulance door closes, what is going on in the back of that, that aircraft or transport rig? And then how do I better support you? So the, the, the value that MTLI has brought to me is, is immense. And I feel truly blessed that I get to be a part of a, a group and an organization and a team um, that truly is invested in growing leaders. I now get to, to be the chair of the capstone committee and really what I do now is just take all of the good work that is done in the past to get the capstone to where it is today. And I get to tweak it and play with it. And, and what the capstone project is, it's a, a fictitious marketplace. Um, and we developed and designed a fictitious marketplace. And it, a lot of the credit goes back to, to Ed for a lot of the creative names. Um, and that fictitious marketplace has multiple entities. And then we use a scientific strategic process to develop groups of six, seven, or eight. And then they, we really focus on diversity within those groups because we want diversity within the, the industry, within the specialties, within your, your area, the country, because that group is going to become your, your team, your, your family for the next 40 straight hours of, of work that people put in over the far, following four or five days. And what we see is that the group process begins and that, that over time, over that four days, of, of truly diving in to understand both your entity and how that entity truly works, and then also the fictitious marketplace. And then slowly over time, they start to solve the problems that we experience every day in the real world. The, the neat thing is that we, we see the, the challenge that the, these individuals go through, and they have to actually dive in and they, they work with people back at home and bring in their expertise they reach out and learn more about their own organization. They learn more about the, the industry. And what we see is they go back through their own monographs, their lectures, and begin to take the, the learning points that they've been experiencing over the last two years and apply them. 
And that's really the goal of the capstone project is take what you have learned both in your career and over the two years at MTLI and figure out how do you demonstrate knowledge of that topic um, of that uh, providing that level of that basic level of leadership. Um, and then on Thursday mornings, they get to present their challenge um, and present their solutions and everything that they have worked on in a board level presentation. And a lot of times it's, it can be the first time that, that the students and, and leaders in the industry have ever had that level of expectation um, to, to be able to present to a board and get feedback from a board that can really help um, give them comfort. It, it makes the first time that they have to present to a real board or a real group of leaders um, it makes it so that it's not the first time and that they have the, that initial experience. Um, and the, they get to do it by Thursday when they're, they're doing that presentation. They're not doing it with a group of strangers. They're doing it with a, a family and a team. And so they have that comfort of the team. And you can really see the group process has worked and it is, has brought that team together so that they're feeling supported as they present. Um, the team that I went through with, I still keep in touch with. Um, and oftentimes it's that small group of six, seven or eight other people um, that become your, your confidants and your closest friends um, in the industry. And you continually go back to them. The neat thing about the capstone over, over the years is that each year we're able to update it and really make it pertinent to, to what is going on today. Um, so when fuel prices go up, the capstone project reflects fuel prices going up. When it's harder and harder to hire staff, um, and, and over time is increasing, we're able to adjust the capstone that it reflects whatever is going on in the real world um, with the, the intent that when we send these leaders back to their, back to their program, they have learned and adopted um, techniques and skills and knowledge that makes them better tomorrow um, as well as better in the future. So I, I'm truly blessed to be a part of a, a group that, that has invested so much in so many students' lives. So. Thank you, Edward. Thanks, Jared. Uh, moving along, Tom Liebman. Thanks, Edward. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to catch up with this group of folks. And, and again, like um, a lot of, a lot of um, my colleagues have said, there's, there's some amazing people that have been part of the school and mentors. And, and I think back in 2009, it was, uh, I was sitting in an interview with Denise Landis and, and, and Bill Kegler trying to be able to join the, the group that is uh, uh, the faculty at, at MTLI. And uh, I'm glad they made, they made a decision to bring me on board as an instructor back then. Um, so I currently, um, I, I currently serve as the chair of the Council of Regents um, uh, right now. So that means my title is, I've inherited as Chief Cat Herder. Denise started the title, uh, Ed continued it. And, and I'm, I'm just really blessed to be part of that um, a line of, of, of kind of helping to, to herd the cats that, that are, is the school. Um, in, in the job that pays me, I'm the, the uh, regional director for Northern Nevada for global medical response. And um, if I go back uh, at the time, uh, in 2009, uh, I was the director of field operations for the Stat Medevac program in, in Pittsburgh. And I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh. Uh, for the last six years, though, I've been living uh, just north of Dallas in, in, in Texas, which is nice because I don't need a snow shovel uh, to be in, in, in Texas, um, which is a very good thing. Um, you know, so for me, you know, my journey, much like everyone else um, with the school, um, was this was really my first experience when I went to the school as a student. Um, I was pretty sheltered in a one program, a large program in, in Western Pennsylvania, but that was my sphere. That was all I knew was that, that world. And <clears throat> going to the school really kind of opened my eyes and said, wow, there's, this is a big industry. There's a lot more to this world. And I think that that's one of the big things or one of the pluses of the school you've heard, um, uh, you know, everybody talk about the, the value is of networking 50% of the school. And I say that all the time, you know, 50% of the school is education. The other 50% is realizing um, that you're not alone, that it's a big industry. And there are a lot of people that, that you can tap it, it, as a resource and meet new people and find out that the problems that you have at your program, uh, whether it's an ambulance service or an air medical service are the same everywhere. And a lot of times people come up with an innovative way to solve it. Um, 
for us, um, you know, the, the big challenge uh, in, in 2020, I, I took over as, as chair of the Council of Regents in 2019, um, the year before the pandemic hit. And, uh, you know, our school is in April, the last week of April every year. And well, what was happening in 2020 in early spring? Well, that was when the, the global pandemic was just starting. And um, at the same time, we had Cameron had just started in her role, uh, I think in January, um, with new staff. And, and now we have to make decisions, very difficult decisions um, about the school and, and what are we going to do. And the, the thing that um, I remember about that time was just the fact that we didn't know anything. Um, the, every day what we knew or understood about the pandemic and the coronavirus, um, it, it just changed every single day. I remember thinking to myself, okay, well, we should be over this by the time the school starts. Well, no, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, and, and so really, you know, the decision we were faced with was how do we, we, we want to keep people safe. Um, but, but we also, you know, need to, you know, worry about the school, the survivability of the school, um, can we continue to, can we deliver the school an alternative model? And the challenge we had was because 50% of the school is networking, you can't do forced networking over Teams and Zoom, um, which I think we all know now, right? Um, because Teams and Zoom are part of our, our work environment much more than they, so they were before the pandemic. Um, but we were able, we, we rallied again, just some amazing people um, um, that work to, to deliver education, we were able to actually deliver a grad school remotely. Uh, and I think at the time, I, I think we were all figuring out how do we use this new technology that we knew was there, didn't really use a lot of, to deliver that education and that content. And so there were things we were just learning on the fly and trying to figure it out. And so the first year we actually had to cancel the school uh, and, and just run a grad school virtually. Um, that was 2020. And then coming into 2021, um, you know, again, information changing. We think the pandemic's easing up, then it comes back. Um, we made a decision to actually, in 2021, we ran two schools. Um, we ran a smaller school in the spring because the pandemic was still a, a factor. Um, and so we ran a year one, year two school in the spring. And then in August, we ran a second full school with year one, year two in grad, um, which is interesting. Um, you know, two schools in the same year. Again, the, the faculty, uh, you know, the Council of Regents just stepped up and was just it was unbelievable um, just working with those people as we, we went through all these problems. And again, you know, um, when, when you're in a room full of, of folks like that, somebody's going to ask the right question that keeps us kind of on track. Um, which is which was very good. The other thing about the two schools, I think in 2021, we had a number of students, I'm thinking maybe five or six, that took their year one in the spring and then came to the school in August and finished their year two, where in the first time ever, they were able to obtain their CMTE in one year, um, which was, uh, which was uh, again, unprecedented. Um, so, you know, that was the, the, the pandemic presented a lot of challenges with that. And, and again, you know, we still have to be mindful of that as we approach the school. You know, this Saturday, um, we're all going to gather. The faculty is going to gather at Ogilvy. And um, this Sunday, the school um, starts. Um, and we're in our 24th year as a school. Next year, we get to celebrate our 25th anniversary, which is very exciting. Um, and we're going to have a full school uh, with grad year one, year two. We actually, I uh, think, tied a record for grad attendance uh, this year. Um, and so we're going to, we're kind of, I, I always, I keep wanting to say back to normal, but I, I caution myself every time I say that, that um, maybe it's not quite there yet. So <clears throat> I keep, I'm hopeful that, that, that we're back to normal uh, with the school. Um, but, you know, uh, the school continues to build, I think, build on the legacy of the past. And, and as we continue to move into the future, you know, we've heard, um, you know, I, I think it was Tom Allenstein talked about the, the student evaluations and that process. And, and we as a faculty go through, comb through those and have for the 24 years of the school gone through those student evaluations, comments, 
and may continue to make continuous tweaks and adjustments to the school to deliver a quality product for the students. You know, there are today um, leaders, in, in new leaders, emerging leaders have a lot of choices on where they could go get leadership education. Um, but, you know, there's only one place where you earn that credential, that certified medical transport executive CMTE uh, after your name, and that's our school. And so um, it, that's a big responsibility. And I think Denise had mentioned the hope was that a lot of folks would put that in their job descriptions. Well, today it's in virtually all job descriptions uh, in, the, in the transport community. And so because of that, we really owe um, everyone uh, to put together a quality product that supports that designation. Um, you know, with the, the combination of the instruction and the capstone simulation, which again is just, it, it just blows me away with the sophistication of the simulation. Um, and, you know, we're able to do things uh, that, that keep the school current and relevant um, that are cutting edge. Um, between the curriculum changes, and we make curriculum changes just about every year, curriculum changes in the capstone simulation. You know, this year, with the capstone simulation, we're going to do mergers and acquisitions where you can actually have an entity that is good, wants to acquire or merge with another entity um, within, the, within the, the capstone simulation, which is just, it's just remarkably exciting. Um, but some of the topics that, that, that we're able to, to kind of pivot and adjust To and make sure that we, um, you know, that's that's a big topic uh, today, um, and, and we need to, to to support leaders in understanding uh, that topic. Diversity, and inclu uh, equity, and inclusion uh, is a is a very important topic, um, and, and 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 we've added actually added that to the curriculum. Mobile integrated health. I think Connie mentioned that we're we're adding that to grad school, and and it's it we're adding that as a component um, in the education in the capstone simulation. Um, and, you know, resource challenges, I think, are what leaders today in the medical transport uh, in, in arena are facing. Uh, personnel staffing, you know, do we have enough uh, nurses, paramedics, EMTs, just, just to be able to respond when somebody needs us? Um, reimbursement, the challenge of the, you know, the, the landscape of, of, of asking to be reimbursed for this, the money and the, that, that you've put out and the service that you've provided. Um, and consolidation as the industry, we have consolidation occurring. Uh, we have, and, and we have in that we have entities that are just going out of business and say, nope, we're closing the doors. Community, figure it out. Um, and so those are the challenges that the leaders that are coming to MTLI today are facing in their daily lives. And so um, as a faculty, I think we're, we're really uh, geared up to addressing that um, and, and, and trying to support and give folks strategies to make it through um, those challenges that, that they face today. And again, Edward, I want to thank you for this opportunity, getting everybody together. Um, this has just been a, a, remarkable, uh, a remarkable, remarkable time to talk about this stuff. Thanks so much, Tom. And then now we move to uh, Cameron, Curtis. Thank you, Edward. And it's so nice to be here with all these faces and hear from the people who were there at the very, very beginning. Um, I'm Cameron Curtis. I'm the president and CEO of the Association of Air Medical Services and the Medevac Foundation International. As several people have alluded to, um, I started in January of 2020, so lucky me. Um, three months in, uh, we were on quarantine and I was new to this industry. Um, I had come, I, I'd run other healthcare uh, associations and nonprofits. Um, I didn't know much about the transport medicine industry. So I had to learn that very quickly on top of how to deal with a pandemic. Um, and, you know, the one thing that I kept hearing, even during the interview process is you have to see our medical transport leadership Institute. It really is, um, you know, an impressive opportunity for people to get together and again, learn leadership skills, but also as everybody has mentioned that networking piece and having been someone who I've been through um, leadership institutes um, for association professionals, I understand the value and, um, and just how it can really impact your career and, and your knowledge moving forward. 
So um, from the Ames perspective, you know, it's, this is one of those things where if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and uh, we have such a, a great group of volunteer leaders who they really do put their heart and soul um, into this program and into raising future leaders. Um, the amount of work that goes into uh, writing the monologues or creating the, the grad school capstone and, and ensuring that that information is fresh and, and up to date. I mean, it, it really is, you know, when you come to the school, um, which unfortunately I didn't get to see really happen in person until April of last year. And, and then it was a smaller school and I didn't have an opportunity to see the grad school. It really is, you know, impressive and mind blowing that, that these, these groups, especially the capstone, I think for me, that, that was the most exciting piece is walking around in the, in the afternoon and the evening and seeing these groups really work together. And, you know, we need to, we need to put that group out of business because we're going to take them over and, and here's what we need to do to improve. And, and really just the, again, the work that's been done from the, from the very beginning with Denise, when she was wearing her suit to go visit Ogle Bay and, and Don and, and Bill to, you know, what it is today with Tom Liebman and, and Jared and Connie and Craig and uh, Tom Allen Stein and Ed Morasco and, and all the other regents and faculty. It, it really is, uh, you know, it, it is our one of our flagship programs. Um, I think from an Ames perspective, you know, we are really using MTLI as sort of a, um, a, a, a Shoot, I'm, it's early in the morning. My, I haven't had enough coffee today. Um, we're using it as a as a roadmap for some of our other education. So our safety management training academy, for example, um, we're adding a sort of a, a grad school component to that where you can come and it, it's also a credential. Um, the other thing that I've done since I started is, um, as many of you may or may not know, is we have a completely new staff team. Um, and with that staff team, we have subject matter experts in logistics and planning and also um, a credentialing specialist. So someone who has worked with credentialing programs for her entire career. So we can really work with the regents to kind of take this to the next level, given the expertise that, that the staff have. Um, the other thing is, you know, we, we are here to support. So we're, we're providing any support needed to the regents, obviously. Um, bringing our experience from credentialing programs that that we have done or or have have run, um, but again, really working hand in hand with the regions to grow this program in the way that uh, respects the tradition but also looks to the future. Um, and it's it really has been great. I'm excited to come uh, in a week and see an actual full school in full swing. Um, and and as I said, Ogle Bay is a great location. I think that. The networking piece is is incredibly important, and I know that I have built relationships in the the credentialing programs that I've gone through. That I still, you know, I still talk to those people. You use them as sounding boards, and um, that is a piece that is is really difficult to, you know, it has to come uh, naturally. It, it's not something that you can force. And um, and as Tom said, you can't do it over Zoom. As much as we have all tried to have Zoom happy hours, they just don't work. <laughs> um, so, so again, it's been a really a, a pleasure to to get to know these folks. I mean, we've had some, you know, there's some growing pains when you have new new teams and and new regents and and sort of finding our way forward. But it really has been um, an honor to to work with this group, and I'm really excited to see where we go next. Um, I'm also happy to see that. The sun, you all can't see this, but the sun is now rising behind Denise because it was 4 a.m. when she started and it looks beautiful. So thank you, Denise, for sharing the sunrise. Um, but that's that's all I have to say, Edward. So thank you again for, for having me. And um, I'm coming to you from lovely Alexandria, Virginia from the Ames headquarters. Great, thanks so much, Cameron. Uh, before we move to a quick break we're, and we'll come back and have a little a more general discussion, I just wanted to introduce myself too. I am uh, was re uh, retired in uh, November 2019 uh, and currently, uh, as you can see, working with uh, Air Medical today, which is part of the EPN network. And I put out news and information with the Air Medical community and always surprised how much uh, how many followers? Uh, it seems like LinkedIn seems to be the place now for many of the uh, air medical programs to get their news and information. 
Um, when I was involved at MTLI, uh, I was at West Michigan Air Care when I first started. And then uh, when I was at Duke University Hospital, and then finally at um, MedServe Management Services. So I was at those three organizations. And one thing that I always did is send a first, uh, only one first year student and only one second year student because I wanted those, those staff members to experience the whole thing and not just hang around together. And uh, I was really glad I did that. I think people really appreciated they came back uh, and learning about all the networking. And MTLI to me was really my favorite time uh, of, of the year for as far as a work activity. Uh, it was uh, very much uh, a family and um, how well we worked together. Uh, the other thing I remember is how much Bill was able to, to guide us because I think at first, uh, and I think Craig had touched on this, this whole idea of, you know, what's the latest stuff and it's no, it's really what are sort of some of the core curriculum things that we need to teach. And uh, mine were uh, strategic planning and negotiating were the, the two that I uh, put together. So uh, the other thing is, you know, this is a, a representative group, many of the founders, but there's many, many others that have been involved with the um, success of this program. And in the show notes, I will put down, um, I worked with uh, Ed Marasco and Tom Liebman in putting this program together. So have a list of all the folks that were current faculty regions or, or past ones. And uh, I'll post that on the thing because I, I do want to thank them uh, for making this uh, successful too. And also the staff at uh, Ogle Bay. So um, right now we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll be back in about five minutes. Thank you. So uh, welcome back everybody. So we're going to now use this as sort of a, an open time for discussion, some questions for people to, to ask uh, others or add on to it. Um, one of the things I had uh, when I came back uh, that one year to help out uh, when I was at LifeLink 3, uh, I was just amazed at the capstone program. And I know, Jared, you uh, touched on that, but uh, because I remember writing the projects for the second year and how difficult that was uh, putting those together, all the uh, funny names and stuff that we, we came up with, but uh, the seriousness of that. So how did the capstone program start? You know, if that's you, Jared, or Tom, or <laughs> well, um, yeah, well, it might be actually all three of us. Uh, it might it, me, uh, Ed Marasco, and Jared. Um, uh, I, I, the genesis of that actually, um, I, again, I got when I started as as faculty teaching as an instructor in two thousand nine. Um, you know, we we divvied up. Um, we had those projects. Uh, Ed Marasco had a project, and, and, and he was saddled with having me as his uh, fellow uh, faculty member uh, to, to present the to run the project with with the students. Um, and and we both started talking about you know what if what if we morphed this into a, more of a simulation type environment where we created an entire world and had entities that played off each other. And so really, Ed. Marasco and I spent a lot of time um, mm -hmm. kind of talking about that. And, and we took our, because the faculty, we had the, the license to say this was our project. So we had the ability to kind of take that project and morph it into that. And um, so, you know, Ed, Ed wrote, you know, like the backdrop. Um, I focused on the, we wanted to take the, the finance piece. Uh, we know students struggled with producing pro formas and financial statements. And so we built a, um, I put together a, a kind of a, a, a financial template that allowed for whatever decision they wanted to make. Um, they could account for it in the, in the, in the spreadsheet and it would automatically produce the pro forma and financial statement based on that. Um, uh, a lot of hours and, and with Ed, Ed, Ed and I <clears throat> matching up, well, all right, I'm going to, we're going to take this entity, this direction. Okay. Well, then I had to go and change the spreadsheet and adjust it and that kind of thing. And I think 
And um, that's my memory of that wonderful, magical time. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things was we had noticed and, and you know, I think Denise, we, we had this discussion in the faculty meeting. Denise said, you know, yeah. people just they I got the HR issue or I got the finance issue or I got they sort of had the cases down. They had the old group projects. down. Oh. So we wanted to create a situation where we could create this backdrop and then we could give each organization within the backdrop. A different challenge each year we could evolve it and i think jared said it during his part of the presentation you know reflective of current events right what's challenging the industry today is different than it was 10 years ago and so by creating that capstone sim kind of approach it was we had the environment all built out and of course these guys i mean it's it's light years ahead of where it was when we first did it and to be honest the genesis of it is my oldest son was was in a program at penn state where they actually did a capstone simulation. It was actually an environment. He was a security and risk analysis major. And that's what they did for, for graduation. You had to do this. They gave them this security environment. And they had to, you know, take what they learned in the program and apply it. So for us, it was like a natural fit. Um, and then, of course, these guys, it's next level now. I can't, I, I'm, I actually want to actually come back to grad school and opt in for that option to do the capstone thing because it'd be cool to live it, right? I think one of the things we talked about before was the fact that the technology's evolved too. And that's that's really been a piece of it. I remember Greg Hildenbrand talking about something that now we'd call the metaverse, but I mean, he wanted to be able to have this so that people could, you know, step right inside of it. And I think we're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't surprise me if, you know, in the next five years or so, that it's truly interactive between each other. And that is one um, project group makes a change in their little part of the universe that the universe changes to accommodate for that. So it's really been amazing. But again, a lot of it's been driven by the, the ability for you know every student to have a computer. That wasn't a reality when we started, you know, the, the ability for them to be able to run a spreadsheet. I remember, you know, literally having to try to teach people how to use Excel or even before that, uh, previous, you know, technologies. Um, so I, I, I think it's really been fascinating to watch the evolution of it. And I think it's just going to accelerate. I think it's going to be amazing over the next five years. Well, and it's funny because Sunday it's a fictitious marketplace and on Thursday it's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That evolution over that time and they, they become part of that community. Right. I think the thing that's always remark remarkable to me is that you pull together five, six people who have, don't know each other, never worked with each other, everything. And you give them a near impossible task. And Thursday comes around and they knock it out of the park every year. They are just, and, and there's no one solution to this, you know, and that's the neat thing, you know, that we have taken what we've learned in medical simulation, aviation simulation, and we've applied it to leadership simulation and how it changes. And, you know, it, it's just, it, it's truly amazing to see a group of people get together and then present to a board on Thursday. And it's just so cool. Mm. Is, you know, is, 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 the, is the Regent's um, role still the same in helping facilitate that? Is there still a process? I know, uh, I think Craig used to go through a thing on group process and the storming norming type of thing. Is that still the same? Yeah, we yeah. still do that and, and are able to um, help. We have uh, faculty mentors that are helping each one of the groups try to keep them on track. And really it's, it's as much as anything, just to be able to nudge them when the group process sort of has its own challenges to be able to keep them going, because it's a really obviously tight window to try to do the level of it. I mean, you know, people have referred to this before. It feels like trying to do a master's thesis in four days. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And um, so the faculty mentors are, are really key to be able to get that done. One of the things I was thinking about is, as we were talking and, and you know, Tom talked about it as far as being able to learn as much from the students as we ever try to impart to them. I remember when the very first group got together and we were sitting out there and Bob Freitas and I looked at each other and went, what are we doing here? You know, I mean, it was kind of, the, you know, and, and we got to the first class and we looked out in the room and we saw these people that were leaders of major oh, programs and stuff. We went, well, why did Denise think we ought to be here? You know, and what you realize is, is that 
what you are is the catalyst for learning and the ability to be able to get people started. And the students will amaze you every time and take over. Mm. You know, the theme that's been going through and, and, and all of you have, have uh, uh, mentioned this in, in one form, the, with COVID, uh, I'm aware of at least one and possibly two schools that said, well, the way we should do this, our students are pushing us, is we should be online. We, you know, universities around the country are online and, and so forth. And I'm going to tell you that, that you all know 50% or more of these schools is the group interaction that you're all talking about. I mean, you just don't get that online. And one of the schools that went online is now failing uh, because they decided, well, you know, we're not going to travel and, you know, and it makes sense. And, and some of the students are going to come back and say, you know, we're doing everything online now. Why can't we just do it online? It's because the best instruction, the best communication is interaction in the evening out, uh, on the capstone projects and so forth. So that's, that's what's made it work in most of the schools. On Bill, I thought that, that, it's, you know, sorry. oh, that's okay. It's those lifelong um, friendships and connections that you make that you can't make over Zoom, no, no matter how hard you try. It's when you're sort of in the, you can't be in the trenches, right? Um, when you're doing the capstone project. And again, I've seen it and watching these, these guys, these, these folks sort of sit in this room together and really they've got flip chart paper everywhere. And I mean, they are really in the midst of this problem. And it's sort of, when you go through the trenches with somebody, you, you use them moving forward as sort of, again, that sounding board and, and that lifelong friendship and connection. And you just, you can't do that over, over Zoom. And I think we all thought that, that meetings were going to go the, the virtual way um, during COVID. And I think the one thing that COVID did is show everybody that regardless of if it's a school or a conference or a board meeting or whatever, you need those personal interactions. So I, I'm just curious with attendance, um, I, I continue to hear that you're all having great numbers, but have you noticed um, with programs with budgets, can they still afford to send people, are people paying more on their own to attend? Because uh, we, we used to track that way in the beginning, you know, I remember we used to take attendance and we <laughs> threatened to call the program because they were spending money on sending students. So I'm just wondering, because there was such a no travel policy for so many um, hospitals, if you will, I, I wonder if that's impacting the school at all. It, it, it's uh, in interesting, Denise, and I remember, I, I, I remember those days as well, I, and I'm trying to think it was 2011 or 2012 when we really had a, the school took a big hit because everybody clamped down on travel and sending and spending money and, oh. and, and we, we really, I don't believe we've really seen a shift that way. Um, okay. And most of the people that come to the school are still supported by their company, their employer. I, I think the pool is a little bit bigger now. And so that, that, that effect is a little bit more blunted. There are still hospital organizations that say, no, we're not going to travel. We're not going to do this. But um, w I think in the attendance numbers, w we really aren't seeing it. Um, I, I would have thought that this year might be the year, even last year might've been the year to see it, but it really hasn't borne out. Um, you know, we're, you know, the grad school, I, I, you know, the record attendance at grad is, is a, is an indicator because that's truly grad yeah. school is yeah. really the, like the voluntary, right? Like, you know, and, yeah. and um, you know, that's, that, that's something. And, and then of course, you know, um, we're, uh, we're, we're challenged a little bit with space this year at Ogilvy. I think we saw um, a lot of, a lot of students that used to maybe share rooms, aren't sharing rooms uh, this year. Um, and so, um, but, but still it's, it's, it's been, it, it's been largely company support. I think as Tom Damon said, or I'm sorry, Tom Allenstein said too, is, you know, really expanding the candidate pool to ALS and BLS. And, and so that it's not just aeromedical leadership, it's really medical transport leadership. And I think that that is, you know, that was a really smart decision when that started and yeah. still an opportunity to, to grow the pool that way. Now that we're talking a little bit about sort of the health of the school, I want to just say thank you to Bill and to his sta early staff, um, okay. Kathy Bollinger and Michelle Witzberger, 
you know, Oakle Bay has not just been the venue for this um, institute. It has been a partner from the very beginning. Um, not only did they add resources and Thank knowledge you, and training um, for the regents early on about what an institute is, but they, they joined forces with, with Ames and really helped share the risk in putting, on, putting together this institute. Mm -hmm. They funded the early losses for the institute. So they were, they were a part, true partner in every sense of the word. And I forgot, and thank you very much. I forgot to mention that one of the reasons, and you ask why Ogilvy, is that because we had an ulterior motive, we needed people, we needed conferences every year. And this is a great, great example. And to do that, we, we took risk. And, and uh, I was able to convince people that we needed to, to build these relationships. And one thing I want to say, and, and I won't, then I'll, and then I'll mute myself is that the people on, on this program, the people that have gone through uh, MTLI as instructors, the, the students need to know that you have not been compensated, that this is a volunteer operate. You give up a week of maybe your vacation. I know people that said, wow, well, yeah, I had to take vacation to do this. All right. And, and the dedication is just absolutely incredible with this school and, and some of the other schools that that people are willing to go out of their way to make to, to make a difference and i think that's great thank you very much i just want to add quickly to what don was saying and, and bill ogle bay is still a great partner today um you know we we've had a few minor challenges but working together with their team it really has been um as you said don a partnership and and one that we look forward to continuing I want to expand upon something that Bill was saying, and that is, you know, the volunteerism of this group. And it's not just a week a year. Um, <laughs> we meet every month. We talk about the curriculum, what needs to change. They revamp the capstone project, which is huge uh, investment and, and everything else. And, and so many of us do it for the love of the students. That's why we do it. You know, it's, it's really, you know, that opportunity. And as we talk about, you know, like grad school, um, most of the students are paying their own way to do that. And if you think about that, you know, they have an opportunity to go to Vero Beach, but no, they come to Wheeling, West Virginia to be with friends, to learn, to, uh, you know, network with colleagues and everything else. Um, we're fortunate because we do have a number of scholarships now that are available. And thanks to Ed Marasco and Joyce, you know, they have a scholarship that they offer up for our, our students to come back and, and do. So um, I do remember the early days when we talked about, is this going to be sustainable? You know, are we going to have enough students next year? And we just continue to see growth and, you know, up to 100 <laughs> students in first year. I mean, I think in the early days, what did we have? 40, 50 at most, I think we had one, you know, one room downstairs filled up and now, you know, we're filling up the lodge and, and it's so fun to see uh, breakfast in the morning and see all the students um, networking and, and, you know, it, it's just a, a neat experience. Well, to your point about the uh, grad school, I think, you know, Disney, it's been amazing to me looking at it over the years is where else do you get to go with 40 to 50, 60, so a relatively small group together and be able to hire, you know, the Studer group or the former editor of the Canadian Broadcasting System or Disney, you know, to be able to present these stuff. So, I mean, real kudos to the folks that have been putting the grad school together all these years because it is world-class education at an incredibly decent value. Um, and I, 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 I really commend the folks that have been doing that over the, the decades, literally to have that quality. And to piggyback on what Bill said, um, and thanks to Denise's leadership, we really became a high performance team. We had to, we had a small group of people. And if one person called out because joint commission was coming to their hospital that week, or somebody had a family emergency, um, we all piled in to pick up those lectures, to pick up that you know, simulation project. Um, and it didn't happen just once a year. It's been multiple years that we've done that um, just to try and 
you know, forward the mission of the school and make sure that it didn't lack in, in missing people that were instructing. Well, Connie, I, I want to add, that, go ahead, Denise. No, I just, you're right, Connie. It was the, it was the loyalty to each other as well. Um, everybody exactly. was supportive of each other. We stayed in contact and, and Bill and Don going back to things that were already mentioned has to be said, um, you know, thank you is a real, it's a great word. And you never stop thanking us. And I think that's what secured our loyalty. We wanted to make this work for you as well. Um, and the thank yous never, never stopped. And that was really special. I just wanted to add, you know, the highs and lows. We were always there for each other when, mm -hmm. when life struck and we had loved ones sick or going through issues. This group of people stood together and, and yeah. we had a individual who had to go out because he had back surgery and we all, you know, stepped up to take on his uh, lectures and all of that. And we called people back from, you know, previous. Edward came back and helped us during, you know, some difficult times when we had lost a few regents. And um, it, it's just, you know, the camaraderie among this group, you know, we talk about the Capstone Project and how, you know, we had five or six people that became lifelong friends. Well, this has been a lifelong friend group here that, that you know, every Saturday, in April, when we get together and we share our life stories is, is some of the most special times uh, that, you know, I feel like I've, I've known their, their kids since they were little all the way up through. Right. And, and we've seen growth and, and all of that. We've, we've seen the happy days. We've seen the sad days and, and we've just always struck together. We've seen people get married at Ogle Bay, right, Tom? Um, mm. And, you know, it, it's become, you know, just part of our lives. Well, I, I have a, uh, uh, one of the regions that we lost, Bob Freitas, that uh, was with us in the beginning. It was uh, difficult. I did get some folks together. I think some of you were on that uh, call where we did a remembrance of Bob, but I wanted to, I told this story then, but I don't repeat it for this too, is that uh, I think it was mentioned that, you know, we do look over the, the uh, reviews of the instructors. And uh, at that time, everybody was like way up there. It was like, you know, when you do reviews of physicians at the hospital, it's usually they're all so high, but Bob was always at the top, <laughs> always. I and mean, it's just like, we're all going, what is he doing? We would sit in his classes and going, what is he doing? So uh, the one year, I think it was 2007 or so, I had uh, you know an issue where I had to stay. I was with MedServe, but I was out at um, Airlift Northwest and I had to stay. So I called Denise. Of course, I had arranged everything beforehand, but I said, Denise, I'm not going to be able to make it. And you could hear a pin drop. There was like, you know, Denise was <laughs> like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And I said, well, don't worry. I've got Bob is coming back and he's going to teach my classes. I'll, I've sent him all the stuff. He's all set. And the funny thing is, is, you know, when you get the reviews each year, those were my highest reviews because there wasn't time to change <laughs> the reviews. So uh, I uh, thank Bob for that. But he, uh, he was a, a, a fun instructor and fun person to be with. He was truly a lovable curmudgeon is what he was. He was, <laughs> he would say, all right, all right, you guys, you're taking this evaluation stuff. You got one bad evaluation out of 60. Don't get off the rails, right? <laughs> That's what I remember Bill talking about all the time, too. You know, you guys are getting scores of 4.8, 4.9 out of 5. Why are you worried about it? Because Bob's getting 4.95, guys. <laughs> No competition, no competition. No, not with this group, never. I, I remember when we asked him to join, and he looked at me, and he was like, "What? What do you want a ground guy for?" <laughs> I'm, I'm largely a ground guy. He was kind of a, yeah. Even his curmudgeonness came out even then. He's like, "You don't want me?" I'm like, "Yeah, we do." Yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting when I when I look back on that very first group, whether you know. Jody Trainer, Lori Dickinson, some yeah. of those folks that were in the original thing. 
there was a certain degree of almost a team of rivals type of a thing in, in the way that it was put together. I mean, Bob, by his own admission, had been somebody who had been throwing stones at Ames, you know, and he was trying to figure out why Denise would possibly ask him to be part of something that would be a school like this. <laughs> but I think that was part of the brilliance of that original group of people who were put together was that it allowed for that diversity that was necessary of thought in order to be able to come up with something that really had some value to it. Because if it had just been groupthink, you know, it would have been another conference. And, and, and the, the school strength, I think, has always been the fact that we challenge each other. Well, we wanted that diversity. We wanted air and ground, um, hospital-based, non-hospital-based, um, to, uh, to be those initial instructors. Yeah, I remember coming up with a grid. It was all the different sort of market segments and all the different topics and ex areas of expertise and yeah, and regions. Oh yeah, Don, you you were our, you didn't let us forget one thing that we said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fun little sort of thing with a how life just winds up becoming its own big circle is that back when we did this and we did the original monographs. Um, I had an administrative assistant, uh, Howard Ragsdale, and I shared one, and he was an intern from the university there in, in, uh, in Provo, BYU, and uh, it was Jonathan, and Jonathan now is going to be our newest uh, instructor regent, so, you know, it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's amazing to see that, you know, it's, it's moved all the way through like that. It's, it's nice to see the change. I'll, as I said, I'll publish the list of all the current faculty and historical and I think what there's three new instructors is that right this mm -hmm. year um, so yeah, three. it's nice to 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 see that uh, movement the, the other thing is I wanted to call out in, in looking over that list the it's really been Craig and Connie that have been with the school for 25 years. So even though this is the 24th year of the school, it's really the 25th anniversary of the genesis of all this. So that's why I wanted to, to do this uh, recording, you know, so that we had it. So. Are you saying that we're old? <laughs> no, you've just. No, okay, just it's, checking. Experience. <laughs> experience. Oh, thank you, right. Tom. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I asked Craig about this a couple of weeks ago. He said he's going out feet first. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have, have to drag me out toes first. <laughs> you know, when I started this, I talked about all the schools that we had, about the first, and most of them were somewhat affiliated in the parks and recreation industry. And that's sort of how Dawn got there with the campground school. You know, some parks had campgrounds and so forth. And for, for what it's worth, I've always had a couple statements. Um, one was <clears throat> if I'm at the San Diego Zoo watching uh, with my grandkids with an elephant and I ask the elephant keeper, have you ever been to Ogilvy? And they'll say, no. And I said, then you're not certified. And uh, I have the same <laughs> comment if, uh, if I ever need a life flight to Pittsburgh Hospital. But if I get on strapped into the gurney and I say, have you ever been to Ogilvy? And they say, no. I'm going to say, give me the next, the next helicopter, please. <laughs> So you don't have to put that in, but I just, I thought that would be an interesting you know, way for me to finish. That. So Bill, Bill, a question I wanted to ask you for a while. I, do you still have the golf school? Yeah. Do I have what? The, the golf, golf school. Actually, yes. no. And what, and in some of the, what happened with some of the schools and Joe Bettitz, who's the director of the National Golf Foundation in Jupiter, I actually still do consulting for him on, on some golf things. Uh -huh. uh, we ran out of, of the student base. The student wow. base all uh -huh. went through the school. And schools have had lives that have been 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. The main <clears throat> maintenance management and parks and recreation is at 50. Other schools, and this was brought up, and it may, may happen someday to, to uh, MTLI, I don't know, the International Association of Venue Management, which is the group that runs mm -hmm. all the stadiums and, and mm -hmm. uh, across the country grew too big. They, they got to the point where they said, we have to take care of our members. There's so many that want to go. And they left Ogilvy two or three years ago for a larger uh -huh. venue in Florida. 
uh, that they had the the model and they were working out with another resort uh, conference area. But it was based on size. It was not enough meeting rooms, not enough sleeping rooms. And uh, they were sad to go. And they're talking about coming back for maybe a graduate school or something. But um, so those things happen. And no, we're happy to to continue to have you. I I see the, <clears throat> see Michelle occasionally and and talk to the Ogilvy folks, and and uh, I'm glad you're still there. And there's always the option of what you did last year, which is have two schools a year. Of course, that takes an awful lot of of uh, <laughs> energy, time, and <clears throat> and volunteerism. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> No, I really, no, I really like you. But yeah. <laughs> well, I think the other unsung heroes in this is our families for putting up with us too, because that's yeah. and that's the difficulty with the idea of having two schools a year is just the the amount of time it takes away from our, our both our employers and from our families. Well, it's funny you said that, Craig, because my youngest child was a week old when I came to Ogle Bay for for my first year. I think it was. And, you know, she just turned 22. So um, our families have grown up with Ogle Bay as well. And, and much thanks to them for what they've put up with. Uh, amen. Uh, you know, our, it, was, it was funny. Our daughter, Amanda, um, <coughs> she's a flight nurse, actually, at Stat Medivac. And she was applying, doing the scholarship to try to go to Ogilvy this year, uh, which, which I just, again, blows me away. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> so is is um mtli the largest school now bill do you know you know um i'm i teach at the university part-time i'm not at Ogilvy a lot yeah. because my grandson's playing golf uh and uh it probably is uh the the um the one that I talked about being 50 years old sells out every year. The maintenance management school, uh, it has a huge database of, uh, you know, every park has maintenance folks. They've been going forever. They may, they do fill the hotel. Uh, IWM was the largest school, uh, but I'd say you probably are now. I, I'd give it more than likely, uh, especially with your graduate school. And the maintenance school has not done well. They tried a graduate school, but but they have not done well. They might get fifteen or twenty folks that would come to that. But I'd say with your two two schools, you're saying you have a hundred students in the first year and grad school, so you're put you're well over the two hundred number. I mean that that puts you in the top, if not the top. Well, I mean we have a, a waiting list every year. I mean, right? You know, so and, and it's based on. Uh, class size and you don't want class sizes too big no. and uh you know it then and based on uh, lodging opportunities when you they they've added uh rooms and cottages uh and facilities uh since since we kicked off mtli uh in fact to get the schools in that when i uh, when i was the lodge manager in 1978 there's already 100 more rooms since then that's telling you how old Ogilvy is, and I am. That uh, they we've had additions to the to the uh, facility that allow for these things to happen. And uh, but I'd say you're probably the biggest. Any other uh, words of wisdom, questions, comments? Uh, we should think about something for our 25th anniversary and invite all the instructors and regents and staff back that have participated um, and celebrate all of our victories. I think that'd be a great idea. We There was a 20th, right? There was people invited back because I did come back for that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I was just 20th. Uh, Denise will run the golf tournament. <laughs> <laughs> she will. Yeah, it's going to be uh, exciting, I think, to, to start – to look forward to the school next year, the 25th anniversary and what we can do, um, you know, working with the, the, the AIM staff and, 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 you know, really celebrate the school and, you know, the year one students that are starting this year on Sunday have an opportunity to be opportunity to be part of that 25th graduating class uh, next year. Yeah. Uh, I, I, 
the other only other thing I would add is um, things I remember fondly is just that um, the regents and the staff um, and the students really worked hard to make the experience fun as well as um, you know chock full of learning. So I think about some of the traditions, the bells and um, uh, you know the the Eddie Awards and um, uh, the prank that <laughs> regions played on one another, and um, you know the the golf game and, and the crazy things that happened there. Uh, I still remember um, the geese chasing one of the regions, <laughs> around, <laughs> of course. And, you know, um, some of my fondest memories. And speaking of that, Don, I remember, you know, the, the golf outing on Tuesday afternoon, because it's always uh, important for us to impart that there's a work-life balance, right? So we take Tuesday afternoons off and that's a free, and all of us sitting on the hillside of the Jones mm -hmm. course. Oh, yeah. And, and as each group came in on the 18th hole, you know, just heckling uh, every group that came in. And the one year that it had, experienced four season golf because we had sun, <laughs> we had rain, we had wind, we had snow. Um, and yes, Denise, I do have pictures of you, you know, <laughs> making a little bobsled trail for your golf ball to travel right to the hole. <laughs> you were, you were just jealous because you didn't think of it first. <laughs> and it went in. <laughs> <laughs> forward to many, many more years of MTLI. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we'll, I, uh, I really appreciate you all being on that. I, I didn't know if we were going to be able to put this together. Um, and I would have loved to have had even some more of the other regions uh, involved, but uh, it was hard enough getting this group and I was about ready to give up. And then I saw when you all answered, I said, well, if we get together real early in the morning. I think we can pull this off. And I remember Denise saying, well, this is going to be just audio, right? And I said, no, it's video. And she said, you're killing me. And I, did, I didn't realize you were out in Arizona at the time. So yeah, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, that's, that's pretty early. So thank you all. And I, you know, thank uh, everyone here, but especially Bill for really helping us with the Genesis, Denise, for your leadership over the years, Ed Morasco for um, your leadership and Tom uh, Liebman carrying, carrying this forward. And it's just delightful to see how successful uh, the school is. And I hope we, uh, Bill, make it to the 50th year. I don't know if maybe I, I can bike or ski into that. I'm not sure, but uh, um, thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Air Medical Today podcast. Please come back again and also subscribe to future shows by visiting the website at airmedtoday.com, iTunes, or on the Air Medical Today YouTube channel. Air Medical Today is also on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, and YouTube, and you can find the links on the website. Remember, if you would like to be a sponsor or provide feedback, please write to webmaster at airmedtoday.com or call 612-367-6052. Special thanks to Stanley Reeves of Room Tunes for providing his song, Track 5, for use as the theme song for the podcast. You can follow Stan on Facebook at facebook.com slash stanley.reeves.39. Take care and continue to be safe with this pandemic.
Thank <laughs> you.